looking at this, right, this, there's, you know, there's a worry that there's a style of learning programming that leads to kind of a derogatory term code monkey. You know, somebody that knows how to fill in the blanks and copy paste from Stack Overflow uh, and, and still get things done. Because most of the world, most of the code in the world is written by code monkeys, and the world revolves around a lot of that. But, you know, I still get this sense of my success has come from a bedrock knowledge, and I don't even advocate that for everyone. I, mean, I, I know how to write the drivers, write the firmware that communicates with the application frameworks, that communicates with the APIs, and does the user interface. But the world doesn't need 10 million of me doing that type of stuff. So it's not something that I can recommend as the right path for people from a career standpoint. But there is a sense of kind of wisdom and breadth of knowledge that I, I, you know, that I find valuable for that. So I think there's something to learning it all the way down at the nuts and bolts, but the, uh, we've gone through some Apple programming. We did a Unity game last year. I uh, you download off of this web page someplace. Uh, and this year, though, we've actually been working in Racket, which is the list that I was talking about. That's one of my reasons for wanting to do a, a server-side program with it, because I'm actually kind of learning it just a few steps ahead of what I'm teaching my son uh, for doing that. And there's some... You know, there's some strong arguments for that where it's got a simplistic IEE where the, the Dr. Racket interfaces, you know, professional programmers are used to Visual Studio, Emacs or something, are going to say, well, this is too crude for real use, but I'm using it professionally right now, but it's almost perfect for a beginning program. You've got the REPL where you can interactively do stuff, it's got a stem debugger you can single step through. I, so that's, I'm having, I have pretty positive things to say about that, and it's kind of a weird thing, it's like, why the hell are you teaching someone Lisp in this day and age? I, but the basics about programming, about well, you've got things and you're computing objects on them, and you've got state and you've got effects. It's reasonable to make graphics, you know, reasonable graphics things in. I, probably a fair argument can be made. If somebody says you should teach people JavaScript, it's hard for me to marshal an argument against that. And JavaScript is really kind of the most popular language around. You can program in your browser, you can share it with people. But I'm not a JavaScript programmer. I, I have no reason to become a JavaScript programmer right now. So it's not the path that I took. Uh, but JavaScript would probably be the safe conservative uh, direction to go for teaching new people things. But uh, Racket is surprisingly useful for this. It's a very niche little thing. I'm a programming language theorist at the academic level. But it actually is a great education language as well as something that I have good results using professionally. Okay, as our last question, I've potentially chosen one that you, that's extraordinarily broad. In other words, you can finish up anything that you possibly have not said yet. Uh, how do you see the gaming industry evolve in the next 10 years? So the gaming industry is a pretty big mature industry right now. And yes, I was not unhappy to be getting out of uh, the AAA gaming uh, grind where you've got multi-year projects with these huge budgets that have to be fairly conservative in a lot of ways. We're building magical things in the gaming industry. I mean, it is, you know, having done this for this time period, thinking back to the games I was playing 20 years ago, looking at what we can do today is mind-blowing. It is incredible. And in fact, I probably wouldn't have been able to predict 20 years ago how good games look and play in many ways are today because it has been like five orders of magnitude or something in power that we've been able to bring to bear on this. And it's incredible. It is really amazing. So I am happy to have been a part of taking things sort of by, you know, up to this level, but I think it's clear to everyone that we've passed the knee of the curve in terms of the cost benefits of expending additional resources on additional fidelity on graphics and audio and these other presentation things. I mean, we can, we can turn back through the console generations as these clear things that, like the burden of the PC, where it's just continuously evolving. And it's, it's hard to not... It's hard to make an argument that, like this current console generation with the Xbox One and the, the PS4, that this is some mind-blowingly, radically different thing without being a company shill there. They are better, no question. They're way easier to develop for. They are absolutely better in any way you want to look at it. But it's not the same kind of better that we used to be expecting with each new generation, where all of a sudden you could do things now that you just plain couldn't do before. 
And it was like I said earlier about the, the creative, uh, the beneficial aspects of, of limitations and how it can bring out some interesting creative aspects here. There's really nothing that you could do now that you couldn't do five years ago. You can have more polygons, better pixel shaders, all this stuff. But as a design standpoint, say, what are the elements that I'm going to have in my game? How are they going to interact? Break it down to the state, you know, the state diagrams and everything. There's nothing that you couldn't have done then. And I don't think there's anything that's holding us back right now that we can say, you know, any vision that somebody spins, whatever massively multiplayer, creative, user-generated content, whatever, you can cobble that all together. It might be incredibly expensive. And we are, you can make analogies, in fact, to uh, semiconductor fabs, where right now we can probably do just about anything we want in games, but it's hard to spin up on a $100 billion or $500 billion project to take the next step and blow people's minds in a way that they haven't been by you know, World of Warcraft or Destiny or whatever other thing that has budgets of these magnitudes that are put into them. So there will be these boomshot projects where it becomes more about bringing together the financing and the team rather than the necessarily detail level design. On the other hand, it was delightful to see the, you know, the touch explosion and then the EMD games explosion and stuff on PC. But people are finding that certainly it's a hard, it's a hard business there. That's not something where you don't go out to be an indie game developer to get rich. You can't look at Notch and say, you know, I want to, I want to be that. I want to get that success there because it's not something that uh, it has to be good. It's a minimum quality to deliver all these things. But there's a lot of other factors that go into things around it. So I do think that right now, I, virtual reality is at one of those great stand, uh, those great points where. Nobody has figured out what the angry birds of virtual reality is going to be. I mean, I think the analogies are really close, where touch games came into their own in many, in many ways, where people started saying, oh, you really want to be doing analog swipes or lots of taps that are direct positioning on there, and these things that mobile's good at. And we haven't hit that moment yet in virtual reality. And while it's very likely going to uh, race to the bottom in many ways like mobile did, and it may happen faster. I mean, we are seeing all of these technical trends accelerating in many ways, where if you look how long it took for things to happen in the PC space versus the mobile space, uh, VR is potentially going to happen even faster. I mean, maybe it will be slower because the adoption rates will be different than phones, but I certainly wouldn't expect it to be something that it takes a decade to sort out, where in some small integer number of years, this kind of green field that's really untrammeled out there will become as, uh, you know, as systematized, productized, and uh, professionalized as what we have on mainstream game development. And mainstream game development is a very professional system right now. Uh, the money is too large for a lot of it to be, to be done in really ad hoc, uh, auteur-driven directions. Uh, and it's a shame in some ways. I mean, it's great. It gives us these magical games that are amazing, but it does close off the opportunity to go do random exploratory things. Uh, you can still do that to some degree in mobile, but that's getting brightly professional as well, where the, uh, the ones that wind up being successful are starting to have bigger and bigger budgets behind it. The VR stuff right now, though, is back in that level of everything's tiny couple-person teams. There's a few things that have significant bonding that are going on, but people still haven't figured it out yet. So that is exciting. I think that we can predict Games, I, you know, I've said before that there are going to be first-person shooters forever now. In every platform, forever, it's a genre that's going to be stable. There's going to be driving games, flying games, fighting games, FPSs. You know, folks, Minecraft now, we can say there are going to be block world games forever after. It's a stable genre. I, you know, I don't think that we have figured out yet what that's going to be on the VR side. We can predict these stable genres will continue to get better. Well, you know, it's crazy to think that we're... Eventually, we'll see a billion-dollar budget production, you know, probably in the next decade, of uh, people throwing that much money into a game uh, development process, development, marketing, rollout, all that, which is staggering when you think about this. When it just doesn't seem all that long ago, and I mean, keep putting quarters in arcade games that were made by one person at a time, and we're looking at billion-dollar productions, or certainly billions of dollars being spent on a regular basis for all of this. So, professional, conventional stuff will continue to get better. We'll have people complaining about the good old days, but the reality is it'll be better than, than it is now. We know the things that are good will make them better. It's a polishing job. 
But the exciting stuff that I can't really predict is what will be the novel new things. You know, massively multiplayer games were, you know, were a great thing. Social aspects of things are great. There's going to be some convergence of social and VR and massively multiplayer. And, uh, all of this is going to come together in some magical way. Everybody waves their hand and says metaverse, but we don't know what that means yet. I, you know, somebody's going to build things that hopefully evolve into that. I don't think it's going to be this top-down architected thing where, you know, I, I was desperately afraid that uh, we were going to sit 15 developers in a room and say, let's build the metaverse. You know, that would have been a terrible direction to go at Oculus and Facebook. So I hopefully it grows from things more organically than that. Uh, and that's the exciting stuff. I don't know where it's going to go. I've got ideas and directions that I'm pushing, which are generally more of these bottom-up things. Like, build some type of focus thing that makes people smile and charms them and then you expand that out in some way rather than trying to design the grandest thing. Because we've seen lots of failures of people go out and try to, to build the grand thing that's going to be everything to everyone. And if they don't keep their eye on the ball and you've got to deliver real value to people right there, the first thing that they do, it better be fun. They don't care if it's this generic space that you can build anything in. People like Minecraft because you get chased by monsters and have to go you know, hide and pull things up. They don't care at the beginning that Redstone is a Turing complete computing device there. So all that matters on the end, but not at the beginning. So I've, I've got my directions and my opinions on things that I push on, but hopefully it's going to be a broad hybrid industry that lots of people participate in. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you all.